Hi guys, welcome to part one of our deep dive into the Telon, our newly released rear shock. Here at Vorsprung, we're excited to bring something truly unique to the world of suspension. If you care about your suspension performance, or even if you're just a massive bike nerd, I think you're gonna love this. If you're a bike shop or a suspension workshop, you'll be absolutely stoked to see just how easy we've made it for you to put your customers on an absolutely dialed suspension setup. We built the Telum to be the most advanced damper on the market in terms of outright performance and tunability, and over the course of these four videos, we're going to really dive deep into the tech to show you all what makes the Telum truly special. First of all, it's important to understand an overarching concept. The Telum is just the physical embodiment of a system. The system is more than just the shock absorber you bolt to your bike, it's the entire ecosystem that takes all your hopes and dreams, crushes them, feeds them through a wood chipper, glues them back together better than you, and then delivers to you a bike with the suspension ride quality that can do everything you'd ever hoped it could, unless you wanted it to commit crimes on your behalf or something. Anyway, the point is that all the fanciest technology or shiny machine parts don't mean anything unless the spring and damping outputs are dialed for the rider and the bike they're on, and that's really where the Telum and the system around that go distinctly further than anything else out there. We'll get to that a bit later on though, so let's start with the basics of the design. By the fourth video, we'll cover the inner mechanics of the rapid revalve mechanism. The Telum is a twin tube design, which, credit where credit is due, was pioneered by Erlans with the first TTX shocks about 30 years ago. It was first brought to the mountain bike market by Kane Creek with Erlans assistance about 20 years ago, and was adopted in certain Fox shocks since about 8 years ago. And of course, it features prominently in Erlans' own lines of mountain bike and motorsport suspension products. Nothing new there then, but a twin tube shock can be designed in a way that makes it a uniquely perfect basis for the rapid revalve technology. Unlike other twin tube shocks that have hit the mountain bike market, it utilizes a solid 22mm diameter main piston, meaning that no oil flows through the main piston at all. Instead, the full piston displacement is pushed up through the inner tube, around through the damping circuits in the reservoir bridge, and then it recirculates between the outer tube and the inner tube, back behind the main piston. The solid main piston is done for a few reasons. First of all, because all the oil is pushed through the damping circuits in the reservoir bridge, we have complete control over the damping curves through damping circuits that are externally accessible. Rapid revalve simply wouldn't be possible on the main piston because you've got no way to get at it from outside the shock. Secondly, solid main piston means that we can have any lockout characteristic that we want without it being affected by what's happening at the main piston valving, unlike some other twin tube designs. While it might seem weird to do something like that on the basis of the lockout, what we are really prioritizing here is the separation of the two. We don't have to compromise the compression curve whatsoever on the basis of the lockout or vice versa. Adjusting one does not affect the other at all. It allows us to use an extended piston with dual glide rings, which in turn means better support to maintain alignment, handle side loading, and in turn less binding, less wear between the piston and the inner tube. Having seen quite a lot of wear issues on various shocks over the years, we felt that this was a pretty high priority. It allows us to use a particular format of hydraulic bottom mount that wouldn't otherwise work within this layout. Now, we could claim that this is optimized because it provides super low compression hysteresis and instantaneous damping response, which is true, but that kind of low hysteresis is not actually specifically a benefit as such on mountain bikes, nor something that we chased specifically. It's just a byproduct of other design elements. We see a lot of marketing touting instantaneous response without properly differentiating between response, meaning the wheel moving out of the way of the bump, or response, meaning the damper generating resistance to movement. The most instantaneous resistive force that exists is stiction because that can generate force before there's even movement and we all know how great that makes your suspension feel. Low hysteresis isn't a problem, but despite what a lot of marketing will tell you, it's also not a solution to anything on a mountain bike. So for those unfamiliar with how twin tubes work, during the compression stroke, the main piston pushes oil up through the inner tube, through the reservoir bridge, where it's restricted by the compression valving, which is made up of a damper piston, a shim stack, the adjuster mechanisms, and the rapid revalve mechanism. This restriction generates the pressure that's acting on the main piston, which creates the damping force we need to keep movement under control. Once the oil has passed through the compression valve, the internal oil pressure provided by the nitrogen charged IFP in the reservoir pushes the oil back through a check valve in the rebound piston, which provides minimal resistance, allowing oil back into the annulus between the inner and outer tubes where it can flow back down and around behind the main piston. During the rebound stroke, much the same thing happens in the reverse direction, but the oil flow through the rebound piston is the primary restriction this time, generating pressure on the backside of the main piston, which slows down the rate of extension. 
as oil reaches the low pressure side of the rebound damping piston in the reservoir bridge, the reservoir pressure again pushes it back through the check valve on the compression piston, which lets it flow back into the top of the inner tube with minimal restriction. So within each of the damping circuits, we have a low speed adjuster needle, which controls the size of the orifice that the bulk of the oil is flowing through at very low speeds when the shims of the high speed circuit haven't opened far yet. On the compression circuit, we also have a high speed adjuster, which helps adjust the amount of high speed damping we have, as well as adjusting the characteristics of the damper during the critical transitional velocities between low and high speeds. We'll dig into that a bit more later on. You'll notice that there's no high speed rebound adjuster. Our first prototypes actually had them. Why would we remove them or not put them into production? Well, four main reasons. First, because of the relatively limited range of velocities in rebound and much higher damping rates compared to compression, there ends up being a massive overlap between high and low speed rebound adjusters of almost any kind. Secondly, as our goal with rebound characteristics is generally to maintain linearity or some modicum of progressivity, there are limited design options that can actually work consistently in rebound as the shim openings are minuscule and we distinctly don't want something that is particularly digressive. So third, over a decade of setting up and tuning suspension of all brands for hundreds if not thousands of riders has taught us that very, very few people have a good grasp of how to set up high and low speed rebound adjustments. It has been historically one of the most common questions we get. How do I set up my high speed and low speed rebound? Furthermore, with the Telem, thanks to rapid revalve, every shock has a rebound tune that's already determined specifically for that bike and rider combination. Because the high speed damping is already calibrated specifically for each use case, the second adjuster simply doesn't need to be there. It's already done. The best setup is the best one that you're able to actually arrive at easily, not the hypothetical mythical beast that the marketing department has convinced you is hidden somewhere in there but you can never quite figure out how to unleash. So we've put in the legwork so that you don't have to. Now, let's take a look at the lockout. The lockout lever is the coolest machine part on the whole shock in my opinion, partly because it's made in a lathe. It uses a tiny little hearth joint interface, so there's no play in it, and it can easily deal with the rotational torque without coming loose. This lockout piston here, which is covered by this shim, uh, and controlled by that lever, like so, relative to the piston, opens up these ports for the open mode, or closes them off and forces oil through the lockout shim stack in the closed mode. Now this lockout piston sits and is clamped in series with the compression piston, meaning any oil that flows through the lockout piston also has to flow through the compression piston. When the lockout piston is open, oil can flow through freely and there is no restriction whatsoever. The preloaded shim stack inside the lockout piston acts as a blow off. That means that it can be quite firm, uh, but also prevents it from being damaged. And while we didn't design it for this purpose specifically, can actually make it really good fun on jump trails if you want a firmer mode on, for example, a downhill bike. We put quite a lot of effort into making the lockout system work well so that it's firm enough without being excessive and so that it opens and closes smoothly without knocking. There's also a tiny bit more low speed rebound damping when locked out, which helps settle things further during seated climbs. Anyway guys, that's part one of this deep dive done. Uh, we'll be back with three more videos uh, going further into the design, further into the tuning process, uh, and to really give you guys an in-depth look and an in-depth understanding of exactly what the Telem is and how it works. Check out the next video to learn more.